Well, we're going to look at the Bible now. So if you um, don't have a Bible with you, there'll be one near you. You can grab one. There's one just in front of you, Elizabeth. You can see it there. Um, we believe that the Bible is a large part of how God makes us people who are courageous in mission. Bible saturated, spirit dependent, and loving of others. That's our strap line. Summarizes our core values. And I want to say that this, this starts on a Sunday morning, but it also carries on in our life groups and our daily devotionals. And this week we're actually taking a break from both of those. I'm going on holiday, which is going to be good. Really looking forward to that. Um, we've got three days off over Christmas, so you can imagine by now I'm pretty exhausted. Uh, so we're going to stay, stay away. So there won't be any life groups or daily devotionals this week, but normally they happen every uh, week uh, for the groups and every day for the devotionals. So it's a really good way of engaging with the Bible the rest of the week and sort of praying it through and thinking about it. And if you'd like to be involved in that, um, please let me know. What happens is I send out a WhatsApp each morning with the text for that day and a little bit of an explanation and just uh, some prayers that we can pray. Each week, though, before we read the Bible, I share a lunchtime summary, and I've broken my core rule. Normally, they are only one sentence long. This is everything I'm going to say, summarise. I like it to be one sentence, but I couldn't do that this week. I could only do two. Um, I ran out of time. Uh, so these are, these are the two sentences that summarise everything I'm going to say. Prizing wealth, comfort, amusement or reputation can be dangerous and destructive. It's better to find joy and peace and security in Jesus. There's a little less. I'm going to say it again. Prizing wealth or comfort or amusement or reputation can be dangerous and destructive. It's better to find joy and peace and security in Jesus. So why don't we look at the Bible together? First of all, we're going to look at Luke chapter 6, verse 17. It's on page 1,030-something. 1,033, I think. Yeah. Right at the bottom of the right-hand column. 1,033. Luke chapter 6 and verse 17. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus is giving in this passage an introduction to the core values that a good life is made up of. So it says, He, that's Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place. People sometimes get a bit lost there. In the mountains of Judea, there are, uh, they are made up of slopes and plains. So you can go down a mountain a little bit, and then you're on a level surface, but you're still quite high up in the air. Does that make sense? That's what he's talking about. So he's been right up, at the, right up on the mountainside praying, and he comes down the mountainside a bit and finds all the people out on the plain. A large crowd of disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, their sort of local towns, who'd come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at the disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, For that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Amen. And then we always read a bit of the Old Testament as well. We usually do. Partly because when Jesus came to teach, one of the things he said he'd come to do was not to do something completely new, but to kind of bring to fulfilment everything that had already been taught to them. So it's really helpful sometimes to see what background Jesus was speaking against or into so that we can understand a little bit more what he's saying, kind of uh, viewing the car from behind, if you think about the metaphor of of, of the way we look at cars. You get a great view from the front, but you also get a a different perspective if you see it from behind. And this is looking at the teaching from behind, as it were. So here is uh, Jeremiah 17. It's on page 777. 
verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to their, what their deeds deserve. Amen. It's the word of God. You can tell, hopefully, that Jeremiah is kind of riffing on, the, on Psalm 1, which we read at the beginning. Uh, it's a really interesting. It's one of those um, readings that confirms to me that people never change. I remember when I was at uh, theological college, um, studying to be a pastor. You know, you get into the middle of some debate, and somebody some, say, somebody would be trying to find the words to express what they were saying, and suddenly they'd be quoting a hymn from their childhood. You know, it's a bit like this. You know, um, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Right? You see, suddenly, in the middle of this discussion, the songs that you learned as a kid come back to you. Um, and the same thing's true for Jeremiah, which I always find really interesting. Um, so what, we're going to look at Luke 6. We're focusing on Luke 6 and what Jesus teaches. As I said, Jesus is challenging our common perceptions of what constitutes a good life. And we don't tend to talk in those terms in the West. It sounds a bit judgmental, but we still have values that we hold about what a good life looks like. Um, I would say one that comes out often in the moment is a good life is one that's uh, happy. There's an awful lot of talk about mental well-being, which is really important. I'm not dismissing that. I'm very in favour of um, uh, helping people with their mental health. I've received enormous help myself. I think it's good. But it's interesting. That's obviously something our society thinks is a good. It's a valuable thing to have. Um, I would say uh, that uh, money, the amount of time we spend talking about the economy, is something else that our society values enormously highly, right? They worry about it a lot. Uh, extending life is almost a good in itself, which is interesting. We saw that over the course of the pandemic. I don't think that massively speaks to this passage, but it's really interesting that extending people's lives has become a, a primary concern for our society in a way that I don't think it was for previous generations. Um, not that everybody thought life was disposable, but they were more resigned to the fact that it will end at some point. It seems to me that we're not very comfortable with that idea. Um, so the pandemic is instructive in that way uh, you, because society sacrificed almost everything else in order to prolong life. Now, you could say that's a good thing. It might well be a good thing, but it's an interesting thing anyway because it's what we think is good. Jesus challenges almost everything that people normally give as an answer to that. So you might think, what are the things that characterize a good life? Well, being well thought of is a good thing. Jesus says, no, it's not. It's a terrible thing. Woe to those who are well thought of. You might think, well, having, uh, you know, making money, getting on at work, the business generating more money or getting promoted is a good thing. And Jesus says, well, no, it's not. Woe to those who are rich. I think, well, having everything I need is a good thing. You know, not being in want. And Jesus says, woe to those who have everything they need. And that's what being full is. You say, well, okay, well, then what about being happy, you know? laughing all the time. Jesus says, no. Woe to those who laugh all the time. You know, you, you're going to have to learn to mourn. What does he mean by this? Well, woe here is an interesting uh, word and, the, and blessing is an interesting word. What they really mean is fortunate and unfortunate. In a good position and not in a good position. It's a bit like a, a car when the warning light comes on telling you something's about to blow up. Right? You know, you're always about to roll out, you're about to, the engine's going to seize up any minute. Or in the most disturbing one, the brake, the brake thing comes on, it says, the brakes aren't working anymore. You're like, ah! It could flash up saying, woe to those whose brakes don't work anymore, right? It's a warning light on the dashboard of the car. Jesus gives these illustrations of what he thinks are good and bad, what are warnings and what are uh, indications of being fortunate, and they are weird. 
I mean, up front, this is a very odd passage. It's bizarre. Actually, a lot of what Jesus says is bizarre. I'm not afraid to say that. A lot of when you read Jesus, if you read him and you take it seriously, it's like, what on earth are you talking about? That's good. If you're in that place of asking that question, then you're in the right place, right? Often Jesus says these very provocative things and then just walks away. And what he's doing is he's waiting to see who comes and asks him. What did that mean? Right? So you find, uh, this happens with the disciples. I'm, you guys bothered to come out for the 11 o'clock service. I'm going to give you the extra stuff. Right? This is the extra stuff they didn't get at 9.30. This happens with the disciples all the time. So there's one thing where they have the parable of the sower. You, know, you probably know the story. You know, a man went out to scatter seed, and some of it falls on the path, and it doesn't go to the ground. The birds come and take it, and some of it grows up, and there are weeds, and so on. He tells this story, and half the crowd walk away and go, well, don't know what that was about. Right? And then the disciples come to Jesus, and they say, can you... Tell us what you were talking about. We sense there's something worth knowing here, and it's important enough for us to take five minutes to go and ask you. And Jesus says, oh, right, because you've come to ask me, blessed are you, because to you is going to be revealed what the answer is. Right? In other words, you bothered to come and ask. Jesus says these, these blessings and woes, and he then just sort of leaves it for us to unpack, and that's what we're going to do now, to take the time to trouble, to understand what he was saying. Before I do that, I just want to address something else, which is that I guarantee that at some point in the next couple of weeks, someone will ask me, why are they different in Luke than they are in Matthew? And this is a kind of proxy for another type of question, which is why does sometimes Jesus' teaching in Luke sound different than it does in Matthew? And actually a wider question about how we read the Bible. Um, There are lots of different explanations to that. The first thing is it's important to know that Luke doesn't contradict Matthew, right? And actually as you're reading the Bible and you come across a passage and you think that isn't exactly what it says somewhere else, it's really important to look at them both together and say, is there actually a contradiction here or are they just complementing each other? Are they just bringing out different aspects of the same event? To give you an illustration of what I mean, I've seen the same football match written up in two different newspapers. One for reporting is Tottenham versus West Ham, imagine. The newspaper which was focused on West Ham will talk about all the incidents in the match that took place that involved West Ham players. The, they almost make no mention of the Tottenham players. Now you read the one in the paper that's focusing on Tottenham, they will mention all the things that focus on, you know, is Harry Kane injured? How did his performance you know, match up? And you think, well, are they describing different matches? No, they're not. They're describing the same football match, but from different perspectives. Right? And that's actually what Matthew and Luke are often doing, and Mark and John as well. They're describing the same three years, or three and a bit years, of Jesus' life from different perspectives to bring out different things. So that's one thing to notice. That's actually a key for looking at contradictions in the Bible or apparent contradictions in the Bible generally. Right? 99 times out of 100, in fact, I'm struggling to think of one that isn't like this, they're either deliberate, so Proverbs says, yeah, always answer a fool according to his folly, and then in the next verse it says, never answer a fool according to his folly. Right? Why is it doing that? Right? It's obviously not a mistake because they could read, that's how they wrote it. Right? Solomon, whoever wrote Proverbs, wrote those two things next to each other. Maybe the answer is there's no good way of answering a fool, right? You're supposed to think about it. In Matthew and Luke, they're also dealing with three years of Jesus' life in which he teaches all the time. So Jesus must have taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sermons. They would have been slightly different in different places. So I teach the same sermon in different services, but already my 11 o'clock sermon is different from my 9.31. Because I like you more. No, not really. Um, I'm recording it, so I better not say that. It's already different, right? Because it's a different group of people here. So Matthew and Luke are selecting different times that Jesus spoke and giving different perspectives on it. There's also something important to notice, which is that Luke explicitly tells us that there are people there from Jerusalem, from Tyre and Sidon. I don't know if this is what he meant by that, but Tyre and Sidon were the places where they minted coins. They made wealth. Um, it's literally the people who are concerned, whose whole business is concerned with being rich. And Jerusalem is the commercial center of Israel. And it's really striking that Luke tells us that these three places are represented amongst this crowd. And then Jesus talks about the important, how we treat wealth, I think. And I think what he's doing is he's looking at a group of people who are wealthy, for whom money is a really big deal. And he's saying, actually, I want to challenge the way that you guys and women see this which is interesting because it speaks to us. So what does he say? Well, his woes and his blessings split into roughly two groups. 
One is to deal with money and resources, so wealth and comfort. The second is dealing with happiness and popularity. So I'm going to split them up. He begins by saying that, uh, or at least the first one is, blessed are those who are poor, but woe to those who are rich and well-fed. Blessed are the poor and hungry, but woe to those who are rich and well-fed. Why? I mean, that's completely counterintuitive. Everything about the way that we live life is organised to make people richer. Sounds very odd. I want to suggest that Jesus is saying this because these things, wealth and self-sufficiency, wealth and comfort, can lead us to pride, to complacency and to anxiety. And that each one of those things isn't true for those who are poor or hungry. First, pride. Why do riches lead to pride? Well, they lead to pride because we start to believe that we're worth it. If we have more money than someone else, we are better than them. Now, some people are explicit about that. Right? You watch something, you know, like Downton Abbey. The Dowager Duchess thinks that she's the bee's knees. Why does she think that? Because she's the Dowager Duchess, and she's got a lot more money than the peasants. So she's jolly well going to tell them what they should and shouldn't do. Right? Ignoring the fact that actually being the Dowager Duchess, you guys seen Downton Abbey, you know what I'm talking about, right? Maggie Smith, yeah? Being the Lord of the Manor is entirely accidental. You happen to have been born it. You weren't, you didn't earn it, you were born it, right? You can say, well, I earned my wealth. Well, did you? You were born in a rich country at a period in time in which it was possible to become richer, right? I have these amazing waistcoats that are, cost me, I don't know, 40, 50 pounds, something like that, a Christmas present. Back in the uh, 200 years ago, there's no way someone in my position could have afforded clothes like these. Just no way. Right, it's an accident. It's an accident of time. It's an accident of place. But riches start to make us think that we're worth something more than other people, right? You ever thought to yourself, why does the Western world feel able to lecture the rest of the world on how it should live? It's really interesting. It used to be because we thought that we had a revelation from God, right? You know, we knew something about Jesus that actually could benefit other people. We're not so into that anymore, but we still tell them how they should and shouldn't live, how they should run their countries, how they should organise their economies, what their sexual values should ought to be. Why do we do that? I suggest it's because we think we're fundamentally better than they are. Why? Because we've made more money. I mean, that's what it comes down to, isn't it? We're rich, you're poor, therefore we're obviously living well, you're living badly. We're pride, proud. Riches and abundance breathe pride, and that leads us away from God and from other people. It's a dangerous place to be in, being proud. I speak as someone who is proud, right? If I have a besetting sin, it's pride. It's a really dangerous place to be. It breeds complacency or indifference. Why? Because when we, are, when we have everything we need, we are fine. We can lean back, we can relax. We don't need God, we don't need other people. That's actually a lie. Everything we have comes from God or from other people. Right, so the waistcoat was made by somebody. Indeed, it was made by workers in wherever it is white stuff make clothes. I'm reliant on them. But I have enough, so maybe I don't need to think about them. I don't need to worry about God because we've organised the economy to the point where we can do what we like. I remember about seven years ago, there was major flooding in this area, and the panic on, uh, I was encountering when we were ministering in the area was extraordinary. Why were people panicking about flooding? I mean, flooding happened, used to happen all the time. I am convinced that a large part of it was because they thought they'd solved the problem and they didn't need to worry about it anymore. You're complacent. We fixed it, we control the world, and now it revealed that we don't. I say the same thing about the pandemic. Why was there the levels of anxiety? Pandemics aren't new. Obviously, they're deeply distressing that lots of people are dying. Very, very difficult. And if you're working in healthcare, the pressure placed on you is almost unbearable. But for the rest of the society, why, is it, why did it cause such a panic which wasn't true of previous pandemics, which were worse? I think it's because we suddenly realised that we weren't in control. Having everything we needed, having stable food supply chains, we can get food any time we want it, we can get anything we want, makes us complacent. We don't need God and we don't need others. The last thing that... Having money, having riches, and having everything we need, being satisfied, does, is it makes us anxious. You might think that that's a funny thing to say. 
it's statistically the two are correlated, right? Society is richer than it ever has been and more anxious and more depressed than it ever has been, according to st studies. Now, I don't know how you measure that for the 17th century, but in, certainly in the 20th century, you can measure this. And the two things are true. It gets richer and richer, and it gets more and more worried. Why? Because you found your resources are the thing you need. They're the thing that brings you joy. They're the thing that brings you security. And they can be taken away at any moment. That's what the pandemic revealed. That's what the floods revealed. It's all gone in an instant. A bad investment. A poor piece of plumbing. A burglar. So riches, people who have a lot, are worried about losing a lot. Whereas when you don't have anything, you're not worried about it at all. Actually, this more fundamental problem. God designed you and me to find our joy and our happiness in him. When we find our joy and our happiness in other things, riches, plenty, comfort, we're not actually scratching that itch. We're not satisfying ourselves. It's like being hungry and eating McDonald's. You get full for a little bit, but you're not really full because it's not good food. What about the last two, then? I should say, it's by, the blessings should be obvious. If we don't have everything we need, if we are reliant on God, and we know that we need other people, we're driven to him and to them. That's why the poor are blessed, why the poor are fortunate. Because when you're poor, you're, you understand your need for God and for other people. So you're driven to them. When you don't have enough food, you're not complacent. You're, you're pursuing God and you're pursuing other people and trying to be in fellowship with him and with them. When you find your satisfaction in God because you don't have anything else, actually you find that the joy that lasts. That's why Paul is able to say, you can put me on a shipwreck, you can put me in prison, and I'm still finding joy. I'm, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've learned the secret of happiness in every circumstance because it can't be taken away from you. God can never be taken away from you. Jesus' love is eternal. It's unchanging. He's yours. But if he's your source of joy, you're not going to lose him in a stock market crash. You're not going to lose him in a bad divorce or in a burglar. So why worry? I say that's actually true. I think Heather and I were much happier in terms of our finances and much less worried when we had no money when I was training. You know, Heather was literally adding up how much money was in the house to work out if she could afford a chocolate bar or a coffee. I mean, you know, literally counting the pennies when I was training to be a vicar than we were when I was earning £120,000 a year. Then all you're doing is you're worried. You're worried all the time. Where's the money going to go? How much am I giving to the tax man? I don't worry about how much I'm going to give to the tax man. Nothing. Brilliant. <laughs> right? My tax return is so easy. Go away. What about then happiness and popularity? Why are these two sources of woe? Surely they're good things. Well, Obviously, being happy is a good thing. But pursuing amusement and laughter all the time isn't a good thing. This is a real danger for us in the age we live in, right? We live in the age of Netflix and DVDs and box sets and endless, you know, I could listen to every jazz musician that's recorded since the 1920s or something at the push of a button if I want to, right? I can be so easily amused, laugh all the time. It might not be. Netflix, it might just be sticking on the daytime TV, I don't know. On one hand, that's great, who cares, right? It's lovely to laugh. On the other hand, if you're constantly amused, it's basically a distraction from the needs of your soul and the needs of the world around you. The needs of my soul and the needs of the world around me. We watch TV, we, we laugh, we listen to music, we laugh, we, we find endless stuff to amuse ourselves, and so we never actually deal with the real issues of life. Where do I stand with God? Am I, is my soul well? Where do I stand with others? Are they in need? If you've only ever learned to laugh, how do you comfort someone who's mourning? How do you walk with them through the valley of the shadow of death? I remember I said this at an earlier service, that the single biggest gift I've been given by God to help me to pastor a church isn't my ability to speak. Right? I, I think if you'd gone to my, my theological college and said to them, what do you think Phil's greatest gift is? They probably would have said, he's been a barrister for five years. First of all, the deck stacked against us, but he, he can speak, right? I can speak. I'm good at it. I don't have a problem saying that because I don't really think it's worth anything. And nor is it learning, right? I've got four degrees. Who cares? 
The single, big, the single thing that is more productive in my ministry than anything else, I spent four years chronically depressed seeing medical professionals for my mental health and going through what I can only describe as the valley of the shadow of death. That produces more fruit in my pastoral ministry, that experience, than anything else I do. Blessed are those who mourn. If you learn how to mourn, you're a gift to others who are mourning. You care about a world that's broken. It's not just about me laughing all the time. You grieve over your own sin. What about popularity? Well, this is the real kicker. and Jesus really sticks the knife in here. I uh, imagine they probably enjoyed this bit. You've got a crowd that's desperate for popularity, including um, you know, religious teachers who are desperate to be popular with each other. And Jesus says, do you know um, who the last people was popular with this group? They were false prophets. They were rarely popular. Do you remember the last people they rejected and threw aside? They were the true prophets. In other words, they're a terrible judge of character, these people whose opinion you want. And if you want their opinion, you will end up doing things you know are wrong to get their approval. And that's true, isn't it? Well, you've got to, I've got three kids in school. That's obviously true. But it's also true in the workplace. It's true at the school gates. The way to get in with the mums who are nice or who are cool is to bitch about the one who's an outsider. The way to get ahead in the workplace is to put down your colleagues and make your own performance look good. And then people will praise you. It's relative. My sons do it all the time. <laughs> they, they're learning this lesson. They think the best way to get ahead with me is to tell me all the things that their brother did wrong so that they look good by comparison. Right? <laughs> You're laughing, but it's happened to you. I guarantee it, right? Why do people do that? Because it works. Who were the last group they were in favour of? The false prophets, the ones who told them everything was great, right? You want to get ahead at work? Be a sycophant with the boss. Tell him everything's great when the company's going under and he'll, he'll promote you. Right? Jesus says, woe to anybody who's like that. If they're saying stuff, good stuff about you, maybe it's for good reasons, but it's a warning sign. Maybe it's for bad reasons. But if you've learnt to be unpopular because of me, in other words, if you've learnt to do the right thing and damn the consequences, you're so fortunate. If you want your life to be a real blessing to other people, that is, I would say, the single biggest gift you need. To be someone who can do what's right and let the heavens fall. That's what Martin Luther King said, let righteousness be done though the heavens fall. What does this mean in practice? Well, first it should prompt us to worship. Well, this is the shape of the gospel. Jesus is saying, actually, those to whom God comes are those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who, who, who long for him, those who, who are grieving because they need him. Jesus loves you at your worst moments. You don't need to impress him. Secondly, it should shape how we approach questions of politics, of work, of finance and family. I'm very careful not to talk about um, politics from a party political perspective in, in the pulpit. None of you know my politics. You don't know how I vote. If you think you do, you're wrong, because I've been careful not to tell you, okay? I'm going to say this up front. If you feel like I'm laboring the point, it's because I want to labor the point. There are perfectly good arguments that uh, the best way to increase wealth for the poor is to cut taxes, generate work in place, and give more people employment, right? That's what I would t tend to call a kind of conservative perspective. There are perfectly good arguments that uh, the best way to take care of the poor is to tax everybody more and provide better public services. Right? And there are some people who say I'm somewhere, somewhere in the middle. I could, might agree with any one of those. You might agree with any one of those. I'm not telling you which answer you should give. I am saying the question is a good one. How does what we're doing, how does how we vote for, how does the policies that are pursued affect the poorest? That's the question to ask, because blessed are the poor. So we need to change our perspective. Riches aren't the thing we aspire to. These are the people who have the kingdom of God. We should care for them. Again, I'm not promoting any particular answer. I can see a good reasons why Christians would give any one of those three answers. In the workplace, uh, some of you are still in work. There will be uh, questions asked about what you should do in the work. Should we take a decision? And the normal, I, when I was a barrister, normally the question was, how can we boost everyone's practice? How do we make more money? 
Well, the question I think the Christians in the room should have been asking, I should have asked at the time, and I didn't, and I've repented of this since, wasn't how can we make more money for all of ours, how can we promote our careers, but how can we take care of the people we employ? It's just a different question. In families, how do you model for your children or your grandchildren that wealth and amusement and reputation are not the most important things in life? How do your children or your grandchildren learn that granny or granddad or mum or dad doesn't think that money matters that much? Doesn't think that watching Netflix is a good use of a life? Now, I'm not saying never watch it, but how do we do that? How do we breed that in our children? Finances. How much do you give away each month? I'm sorry to be direct. I feel I can be because how much I earn doesn't depend on that. I don't go up or down depending on how much you give. I'm not, I'm not a percentage. Nice if I was because the church has tripled in size. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. So I don't have a dog in this fight. How much do you give? If you can't afford to give, don't give. If you can afford to give, give all you can. Christianity's approach to money is really easy. Earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, give as much as you can. Each of us is rich in another way, one way or another. And I just want to finish with this. All of us live in a part of the world in a time where we are rich, where we are well fed, where we are amused, and where, generally speaking, people respect us and we are popular. That is four out of four warning lights on the dashboard. If I have four warning lights on my car's dashboard, I would stop the car and try and work out if something was wrong. Now, it might be that there isn't. You can't affect where you were born or, you know, and John Wesley would say, if you have the capacity to earn money, you should earn money so that you can give it to other people, right? I agree with that. But each one of us should be regularly taking an audit of our life and saying, where am I on this? Being rich is a dangerous place to be in. Being popular is a dangerous place to be. Being amused all the time is a dangerous place to be. How am I doing with this? Prizing wealth, comfort, amusement or reputation can be dangerous and destructive. It's better to find joy and peace and security in Jesus.